Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from heaven. You that live in the heights above, praise him, all his angels, all his heavenly armies. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, shining stars. Praise him, highest heavens and the waters above. Let all the praise name of the Lord. He commanded and they were created. By his command they were fixed in their places forever and they cannot disobey. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, strong winds that obey his command. Praise him, hills and mountains, fruit trees and forests, all animals, tame and wild, reptiles and birds. Praise him, kings and all peoples, princes and all other rulers, girls and young men, old people and children too. Let them all praise the name of the Lord. His name is greater than all others. His glory is above earth and heaven. He made his nation strong so that all his people praise him. The people of Israel so dear to him. Praise the Lord. Let us stand and sing together on page 25 in joyful noise. Praise him. Praise him, God of creation. Let all things that he made now sing his great glory, glory, glory. Father, you are the God of all creation. And we, your creatures, come into your presence and we praise you. Lord, like the psalmist, we say that when we consider the, the heavens, the work of your hands, what is man that you should care for him, should think of him, you have said that you have made us a little while lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honour, made us ruler over all things. Your word says that you made man ruler over all things. However, we do not see man ruling over all things now. But we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels so that through God's grace he should die for everyone. We see him now crowned with glory and honour because of the death he suffered. You said, Lord, that it was only right that you who create and preserve all things should make Jesus perfect through suffering in order to bring many sons to share his glory. For Jesus is the one who leads them to salvation. But we thank you, Lord, for that one who came so low for our sakes, that we might become so rich. We thank you that we see him tonight crowned with glory and honour, that you have raised him to the highest place above, given him a name that is greater than any other name 
And so in honour of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees. And all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Lord, we, your creatures, come and praise you for our creation. We praise you for our redemption in Jesus Christ. And we praise you too, Lord, that one day we're going to be placed right with him. We're going to sit with him. Indeed, we do sit with him now in heavenly places. We have been raised with him, far above all principalities and powers. We have been made heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ to share in all that glory that he has won for himself, deservedly so. And we're going to share in that. So we praise you tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Sing we the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation his empire shall bring. Joy to the nations when Jesus is King.
Uh, very often when playing instrumental music um, in a church service, one sometimes feels one has to justify it, but I really don't think that is necessary because a piece of instrumental music can express God as well as words about God. And uh, this is our belief. And we hope that if you like this piece, and it's not everyone's cup of tea, uh, you will give God the praise for having helped a composer to create it. I don't know what you do when you listen to music like that. I just let my imagination run free. And I don't know where you were, but I was in some meadows by a river and just looking up at the hills and mountains beyond and seeing a few birds just fluttering through the sky and just seeing the river winding its way through the meadows. It was such a beautiful scene and it seemed to be very lovely countryside. But unfortunately, the whole of God's creation isn't quite like that. It would be lovely if it were, but something has gone terribly wrong with the world that God has created it. I want to read from Matthew chapter 13, page 20 in the New Testament of the Good News Bible, verse 24 of Matthew 13, and then jumping to verse 36. No, we'll read the whole passage from 24 to 43. Jesus told them another parable. 
The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man sowed good seed in his field. One night when everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the plants grew and the ears of corn began to form, then the weeds showed up. The man's servants came to him and said, Sir, it was good seed you sowed in your field. Where did the weeds come from? It was some enemy who did this, he answered. Do you want us to go and pull up the weeds, they asked him. No, he answered, because as you gather the weeds, you might pull up some of the wheat along with them. Let the wheat and the weeds both grow together until harvest. Then I will tell the harvest workers to pull up the weeds first, tie them in bundles and burn them, and then to gather in the wheat and put it in my barn. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man takes a mustard seed and sows it in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it grows up, it is the biggest of all plants. It becomes a tree so that birds come and make their nests in its branches. Jesus told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A woman takes some yeast and mixes it with 40 liters of flour until the whole batch of dough rises. Jesus used parables to tell all these things to the crowds. He would not say a thing to them without using a parable. He did this to make what the prophet had said come true. I will use parables when I speak to them. I will tell them things unknown since the creation of the world. When Jesus had left the crowd and gone indoors, his disciples came to him and said, tell us what the parable about the weeds in the field means. Jesus answered, the man who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed is the people who belong to the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. And the enemy who sowed the weeds is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvest workers are angels. And just as the weeds are gathered up and burnt in the fire, so the same thing will happen at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels to gather up out of his kingdom all those who cause people to sin and all others who do evil things. And they will throw them into the fiery furnace where they will cry and grind their teeth. Then God's people will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. Listen then, if you have ears. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, you have said that through your Son you have decided to bring the whole universe back to yourself. And Lord, you have placed us in this world that you have created. We're told that the whole of creation waits with eager longing for God to reveal his Son. And Lord, we ask you that you will forgive us that we've had such a small view on what you intend to do. You have placed us in this world with a great purpose and plan and great responsibility. And yet, Lord, we have virtually ignored the world. We've abused your creation. You placed us as lords over your creation and yet look what we have done with it we've exploited it we've dirtied it we've polluted it we've abused it and Father we ask that you will forgive us for abusing what you have created and we ask Lord that you will give us a bigger view of our world and of your intentions in this world. Lord, save us from grouping together like frightened people who are just waiting for the day when 
you're going to take us all away. You said that we're going to rule on this earth. You want us as part of your redemption plan to reclaim this world for you. Give us eyes to see. Give us hearts that will be enlarged to grasp what you are doing and what you are wanting to do. Speak to us tonight, Lord. Fill our hearts afresh with your spirit. May we go from this place tonight with fresh determination to see this world and all in it brought under your sovereignty. That Jesus might be Lord of all aspects of our lives and the lives which we touch and the areas in which we move. Lord, there is so much suffering, so much need in the world today. Lord, give us hearts that will feel for the suffering and not just hearts that will feel but wills that will seek to reach out and to touch that suffering as you touched it. Lord, we just pray in Jesus' name. Renew us in your redemption plan in bringing this whole universe back to yourself. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just bow our heads in prayer a moment. I feel very deeply burdened tonight with the message that I have to bring to you because I'm very much aware that Satan and the principalities and the powers don't want you to receive or hear this message tonight. That this will give you an insight into his evil plans and how they are going to be frustrated. So I believe we need to pray that the Lord Jesus Christ may reign over the next half hour or so. Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, the name high over all in hell or earth or sky. Angels and men before it fall and devils fear and fly. Lord Jesus, as we seek to enlarge our thinking tonight, as we get a world perspective on your authority, we pray now in your name that there may be no distraction of our attention, no division of our affections, no diversion of our intentions, nothing that would rob us of your word to us tonight. Lord, we thank you that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. And you've got the whole world in your hand. That's where we start tonight. But Lord, help us to face the facts. Help us to be utterly real. That people may know that we who belong to you are not those who run away from reality. But face it and stand and having done all, still stand. We are conscious, very conscious, Lord, of the spiritual battlefield into which we came when we came into you. That even in the heavenly places themselves there's an almighty warfare going on. We thank you that there is no doubt about the outcome but that does not reduce the severity of the conflict. And so we pray now, Lord, will you control my words? Will you open all our hearts and ears that we may hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches? For your name's sake, amen.
October the 22nd to the 29th is the week of prayer for world peace. And around the world, many people have been gathering together to pray for one world. On Thursday evening, the Bishop of Guildford addressed the local council of churches and drew our attention to some of the stark facts of our existence and the world in which our children and grandchildren, if we have grandchildren, will have to live. And there are two facts about our situation which we must start with. And the first is that we live on a shrinking planet. Last Sunday evening was a very different service to tonight. And we had those model aircraft and those aeroplanes flying all over that map above my head. That whole world is now a matter of hours away from our reach. You could go there between now and midnight almost to the other side of the world. It's incredible. Indeed, if you went in a spaceship before this service has ended, you could be above New Zealand. It is a global village. Communications mean that we know exactly what's happening the other side of the world almost while it happens. And the other fact that goes alongside that is that this shrinking planet is getting very, very crowded. There are now 4,000 million people living on this spaceship Earth. And the Club of Rome issued a book which estimated that our resources are going to run out in 30 years' time. A few years ago, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology fed into a computer some 600 equations Concerning, concerning our resources of oil, coal, food, and the rest. And asked the computer, how much longer do we have? And the answer was 25 years. Unless there is a radical change in resources, in population, in a number of other factors. When I went into the Guildford College of Technology for one of their open days, there was a young student playing with a computer, and I said, what are you doing? What program are you feeding in? What are you trying to find out? He said, I'm trying to find out the date of the end of the world. And he was serious. And he was repeating that Massachusetts experiment to find out just how much longer we have. Already on spaceship Earth, we're running out of fuel. We haven't got enough food for everybody now. We are likely over the next 10 years to run out of fresh water unless there's a radical change. We may not have enough air to breathe by the turn of the century. We certainly haven't enough work to go around. We are in a very serious situation. And so there is a growing realization that with this shrinking planet and this expanding population, that we have got to get it together within our lifetime, that we've got to learn to live as one world, We've got to learn to share our resources. Some of the quotes we had on Thursday evening were as follows. Martin Luther King said, We are now all tenants in one world house. Arnold Toynbee, in his largest history book, written or published posthumously, said this, Our survival depends on the unification of the entire inhabited world. And Barbara Cartland has said this, sorry, Barbara Ward said, if the crew, sorry about that, <laughs> said, if the crew can't agree, then spaceship Earth is doomed. Now, all this led to this tremendous sense of need to pray for one world, to pray for the reconciliation of East and West, of Jew and Arab, black and white, rich and poor, developed and undeveloped, and so all over the world there have been prayer meetings and on Friday evening we gathered together in St. Nicholas and joined in what was going to be an all-night vigil of prayer for one world. Now those of you who came along and supported us the first part of the evening will forgive me I trust if I repeat again the things that I said there but I feel such a burden to say them because Christians are getting confused and bewildered as they think about our world and its future. And there are differing attitudes and therefore different actions being urged upon Christians. 
which are going to confuse and divide us if we're not careful. We must know where we stand in relationship to the world in which we live. Is there any hope, to put it in a nutshell, is there any hope of our ever seeing a united world in which all the races are living together in harmony, in which all the resources are being shared out equally, in which my brother in India who hasn't had a meal today gets some of my meal? Is there any hope of this coming about? Are we any nearer seeing one world? Or are we heading for disaster? Now on Friday evening and Saturday morning we had to pray within our faith. And it depends on your faith what your reaction to this whole situation, this whole cry for prayer is. The leaflet asking us to pray said this, Can you pray for these things? Can you put your trust in the power of good to overcome evil and the power of love to overcome hatred? Can you? Can you pray for a vision to see and the faith to believe a world emancipated from violence? Can you? Can you believe in a new world where fear shall no longer lead men to commit injustice nor selfishness make them bring suffering to others? Well, can you? There are two questions we've got to ask if we're going to lay a firm foundation for our faith and pray within that faith and from it. And the first question is a very simple one. Whose world is it? Unfortunately, the answer is not so simple. The question is, whose world is it? Now, the humanist looks at our world scene and he sees it as a struggle between superpowers. There was the West, the East, and now an emerging conglomeration of developing nations collectively referred to as the Third World. And the humanist sees the answer to the question, whose world is it, in terms of those three power blocks? Which of them is going to win? The West is now in decline, the East seems to have become static, and the Third World is definitely on the move. One of the things that the West Indian pastor speaking to us on Friday night warned us about. He said, pray that when the third world, particularly the black part of it, comes to power, that they will not take revenge on you whites. He said, my forefathers were taken from their homes as slaves to the West Indies by you whites. Pray that when they come to power, they will not take revenge on you. That is a very urgent and healthy warning. But we're met here as Christians tonight and we don't ask the question in human terms. We look from a different perspective and we see not human superpowers but supernatural superpowers. And again we see three. And I want to state those three superpowers in simple terms. The answer to the question, whose world is it, is first, it is God's world because he has created it. That's the first superpower in the picture. And the second fact is, this is Satan's world because he has corrupted it. And we face that fact. And the third is, this is Christ's world because he has conquered it. And only if you get these three dimensions will you get the true picture of what's happening to our world. Only as you understand the struggle between these three superpowers or between two of them and the other will you be able to interpret what you read in your morning newspaper tomorrow. And will you understand how, if ever, we can have one world. Now let me start with the first. It's God's world because he created it. My Bible begins with just three, five rather simple words. In the beginning, God created. And it is fundamental to this entire book and therefore to the whole Christian worldview that God made that world. It is an act of faith to believe it because more people today believe it came about by chance than by choice. 
More people today either believe that matter is eternal or that nothing turned into something, just like that. I think that takes more faith than believing in God. But nevertheless, it does take faith to believe that an invisible God, a spiritual being, brought matter into existence and that what appears was made out of that which does not appear. But that's where we begin. This is God's world. He made it. He sustains it. The sun would not have risen this morning if God had not said so. It is God's world. And there are certain things that follow from that which fill out the picture for the Christian. The first thing is that everything God has made is good. That's a very important thing to grasp. When Paul came across certain obscure religious sects who were teaching that you should practice total abstinence from sex and total abstinence from this kind of food and that kind of food, Paul swept that heresy away by saying, don't you realize that God created all things and that he gave us all things freely to enjoy? These are God's creatures you're despising. It is God's world. He made these things. He gave them to us. Now that is the first fundamental fact in the situation. When we ask, is it possible to have one world, then we say it is God's world. He created it. He controls it. Something else follows too. That all human beings belong to one race. There are not many races on earth. There is only one. As Paul put it when preaching in the center of intellectual life in his world, Athens, he said, God made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth and before they came to be God fixed how long each nation would survive and how much land they would possess God is in charge of history it is God's world he made the whole human race and he decided the limits and boundaries of their habitation he decided their place in time and space now that is the biblical viewpoint this is God's world and it is he who made the nations from one man we all belong to the human race. It matters not whether I'm white, black, gray, brown, pink, or whatever. We belong to one race, one world already. It is God's world because he created it. But that's not how it looks. It doesn't look as if God is in control of it. It doesn't look as if it's just one race. It looks a mess. It looks like a world out of control. No wonder the play appeared in the West End of London, Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. But you can't get off it. We're on Spaceship Earth, for better or worse, and we're flying through space at this moment at 19 miles a second. Fasten your seatbelts. That's what you're traveling at the moment. And here we are on this spaceship, this crowded little spaceship, running out of fuel and food. One world... God's world, but it doesn't look that way. The second fact, which every Christian takes into account, is this, and it's clearly written right through this book. This is also Satan's world because he has corrupted it. Genesis 1 says it's God's world because he created it, but Genesis 3 says it is Satan's world because he corrupted it. Evil came in from outside the human race. It got right in, but it came from outside. And evil is a person, not a thing. It's not a force. There is a mind behind the force of evil, and that mind infected and distorted and even destroyed. Relationship after relationship. The reason we haven't got one world is that Satan has corrupted it. And the first relationship that God created was between a man and his wife, and it was that relationship which Satan corrupted then he next corrupted the relationship between their two sons and one murdered the other. And ever since he has been breaking people off from each other, parents from children, children from parents, black from white and white from black, rich from poor and poor from rich, east from west and west from east. He's in the business of separating people from one another. And we need to take desperately seriously the fact that the word world in the Bible is used more often of a system which is destroying the human race and is headed up by an evil person. Now take the devil seriously. Never laugh at Satan. There are plenty of jokes about him. Don't ever laugh at him. 
take him as seriously as Jesus did. Jesus said he is the prince of this world. He is the ruler of this world. He is the God of this world. That's how seriously he took him. And indeed, through the whole of the rest of the New Testament, there runs this thread which makes it quite clear. We know, says the Apostle John, that we belong to God. But the whole world lies in the grip of the evil one. And that means that he's been able to corrupt education, science, politics, commerce, arts, whatever field of human activity and endeavor you name, Satan has got into that field and has corrupted it. And it is he who controls the world system. He has corrupted it. And that's the second fact. Again, it takes faith to believe this. It's so much easier to not to believe in the invisible and to believe in what you can see and say the troubles in the world are due to that group of people. And if we could only get rid of them, we could have peace. If only we could get rid of that political party or that social group, then we would have peace. If only they would go back home to where they belong, then we could have peace. But I tell you tonight that until Satan is dealt with, you cannot have peace. There will never be one world as long as Satan is the ruler of it. As soon as you get people together, Satan is there to get drag them apart again. Every time I unite a couple in holy matrimony, I think of the one who knows about that wedding and who wants to get in there and divide it. Never mind nations getting together. Just two people deciding to love one another for a lifetime and Satan is there to break it up. Now that's fact number two. And I can understand the Scotland Yard inspector who was asked, do you believe in a personal devil? And he said, of course I do. And his questioner said, have you seen him? He said, no. Then why do you believe in him? He said, I'll tell you why. There are times in London when there's an outbreak of petty crime. And he said, we open a new file because we see when we pick up these petty criminals that they haven't got the brains to think up the crimes they've committed. And we know that there's a new king of the underworld. There's a new gang leader in London. And though we've never set eyes on him, we open a file and we label it Mr. X. And from what he does with these petty criminals, we build up the picture and we know he exists. And gradually the picture fills out until we're able to put our hand on him. And he said, in the same way, I have looked at what Satan does to people. And I can build up the picture of Mr. X to believe it's God's world because no man has ever seen God. It takes faith to believe it's Satan's world and that there is a personal devil and that he's corrupted it. Now I come to the first, the third fact which faith needs to grasp if we're going to answer our question and that is, it is Christ's world for he has conquered it. One of our Lord's favorite sayings to people was, cheer up! You count how many times he said cheer up but do you know the reason he gave? for telling them to cheer up, it was this. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I'm on top of it. I met somebody the other day and said, how are you? And he said, very well over the circumstances. That's a lovely answer. <laughs> very well over the circumstances, but he could only say that because he was a man in Christ. And he was only able to cheer me up by saying that because Christ had overcome the world and he was over the circumstances in Christ. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. When Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, this is what he said. Now comes the judgment of this world. In fact, the only sense in which the world was then united was that the world stood in the dock of God's court, guilty. But Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world, now is the prince of this world, thrown out and I'm going to be lifted up and if I'm lifted up all men will be drawn to me there's a note of triumph there that's coming through I've overcome now he's, he's out and I'm in and I'll be lifted up and all men will be drawn to me 
There's a confidence there that shines in the faith of the apostles wherever they preached. They preached the same thing. You can flick over the pages of the New Testament and you find Paul telling the Corinthians that one day all the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdoms of our Christ. The note of triumph there, he writes to the Philippians and he says without any qualifications whatsoever, one day every knee will bow, every tongue confess. He writes to the Ephesians and he says, as Phil has already quoted earlier in the prayer in the service, that it is God's intention to bring the whole world into Christ. And the New Testament has no doubt whatever that this is Christ's world because he's overcome it. Now that takes faith because it is not apparent. People say Christianity has been in the world 2,000 years. And what effect has it had? Well, one could give quite an answer to that question, but one acknowledges that it is not yet apparent we do not yet see all things subject to him. We see the devil still has a lot of power. We know that we belong to God, but we also know that the whole world still lies in the grip of the evil one. Now, it is these three facts which we must hold together in tension. We must have all three dimensions in our faith as we pray for one world, as we think of the question, will we ever have one united world? It is God's world because he created it. It is Satan's world because he corrupted it. It is Christ's world because he conquered it. But let me just say two things before we move on to qualify what I've said. The first qualification, these three are not equal powers. This is not a triangle of equilateral forces struggling for the world. If it were, the outcome would be uncertain. Let me say that God alone of these three has absolute power. Satan only corrupted this world because of God's permission. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth because it was given to him. So let's understand that God still has the whole world in his hand. The second thing by way of qualification that I want to say is this that Jesus and Satan are not equal. Satan is a creature. Jesus was the creator. And so it is not an equilateral triangle of forces. Now I'm in a position to approach a more practical question. If this is God's world and Satan's world and Christ's world, if it's all three, then what is am I going to do about it? What is my attitude towards it? What is going to be my relationship to this world? And again, there are three attitudes which are now appearing very clearly among Christians. Unfortunately, Christians are not united on this. There are three views about this one world that we're seeking and praying for which are based on the three facts I've told you. It depends which of those three facts you start with in your thinking, which attitude and therefore what action you take in your relationship to our world. There is an optimistic view which is based on the first fact by itself. There is a pessimistic view which is based on the second fact and there is a realistic view the one I want to call you to tonight, which is based on that third fact. Let me spell them out. Here's the optimistic view. I put in my pocket or in my bag to come here three books. You'll find these three views spelled out here, more or less. And there's good in all three books, but it will illustrate what I mean. I picked them out from my bookshelves. Here's the first book by David Brown. Bishop of Guildford, God's Tomorrow. Largely the optimistic view. Here's a book by that unique Chinese Christian, Watchman Nee, Love Not the World, which inclines to that pessimistic view. And here is a book by a pseudonym, A. N. Triton, called Whose World, which tends towards the realistic view. I want to spell these three views out so that you can come to your own conviction about these matters. First of all, what is the optimistic view? The optimistic view 
is that the kingdom of good will triumph over all evil and that good is gradually going to increase and evil is going to decrease until we have established the kingdom of God through the whole earth. Until the church has triumphed and brought together everybody into one world. Now that is the optimistic view. I find it a view increasingly difficult to believe because I don't think we're getting nearer a united world. Much though I respect all prayer and all effort to bring men together, I just cannot believe this view. This view starts from this belief that it is God's world. Usually those who hold it find difficulty in believing in the personal devil. They find difficulty in believing that there is a kingdom of evil. It is the view that all men still belong to God, that all men will be saved, and that if only we can get the broken pieces of God's world and repair it and put them together and somehow reunite the world, then the kingdom of God is going to be established. Many of our missionary hymns from the 19th century have this naive optimism about them. I, I would almost call it an ecclesiastical imperialism whereby the church is going out to conquer the world until every nation has been brought under the Lordship of Christ. But now, since the missionary endeavor is failing in so many countries, there's a change of tune, and the tune is now, let's unite all religions. Let's get it together. And the two leaflets that were produced for the week of prayer for world peace, here's one. It has prayers, a Buddhist prayer, a Hindu prayer, a Muslim prayer, a Sikh prayer, a Jewish prayer, and a Christian prayer. And the thrust is, if only we could get the religions together, we'd get the world together. That is naive optimism. And the other leaflet we were given included readings from the Quran, from Abdul Baha, from the Buddhist Ashoka, from the Zoroastrian scriptures, from the Panchatantra, from the Metta Sutta, the Buddhist scriptures, from Mahatma Gandhi, and a few from the churches. This is naive. The World Congress of Faith is one of the bodies sponsoring the Week of Prayer for World Peace. It began, it was begun by John Foster Dulles in the San Francisco Cow Palace, whatever that is. And its second world meeting was in Guildford Cathedral. And it is based on the view that all parts, all cultures, all races, every part of God's world is simply a broken part that needs to be stuck together again. And that if only we could unite the world, reunite it in the name of Christ and get all religions together and all cultures together and all people living happily together, that would bring one world. I just do not believe that Satan would ever give us a chance to do it. Nor do I believe that that is the right approach. Let me then swing to the pessimistic view. This says the kingdom of evil is going to increase and good is going to decrease. And therefore there is no hope of saving the world at all. And therefore the attitude should be reject the world and get out of it. And the main purpose in life is to get through this world and out of it as quickly as you possibly can and have as little to do with it in the process. Now let me say that if you took the Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan as the total picture of Christianity, you would get that impression that our main relationship to the world is to get through it and out of it as quick as possible and as untouched by it as possible. Now this pessimistic view is very negative. It has the attitude of sailing on the Titanic after it has struck the iceberg. It says the whole ship is sinking. You may dance on, but we as Christians, our job is to persuade as many individuals as we can at least to put on the life jacket of personal faith if we can't get you into the lifeboat of the church. But there's no hope for the ship whatever. And only a few of us are going to be saved from the wreck. 
And this attitude led Christians to withdraw from social involvement, from cultural involvement, from political involvement, and it led them to an escapist faith which rightly deserves the criticism it has received. Pie in the sky when you die. Now that's the pessimistic view. The optimistic view says good will increase and evil will decrease. And therefore our call is to reunite the world. The pessimistic view is evil will increase and good will decrease. There will be a great falling away in the last days. There will be only a few of us left in the light boat. And therefore pull out of the world. Pull out of influence in it. Pull away from it. Come ye out from among them and be separate. Now I'm quoting the Bible there, but a little out of context. The serious side of this pessimistic view, if the first view is characteristic of liberal Christians, the second view has got a real hold of many evangelical Christians, the serious side of it is that we withdraw from whole areas of life and leave it to Satan. And so we withdraw from this world and that world and we leave it to Satan. I just caught sight of Cliff there and I thought of the pressure you were under to withdraw from the world that you were in when Christ laid hold on you. And you got that pressure from Christians. And they said, come out of it. Come into the lifeboat. Don't stay in there. You can't do anything in there. Come right out. And what he's experienced, we've experienced in other directions. And this has meant a wholesale abandonment of areas of English life to Satan. And boy, does he move in when we move out. There was a time when there were enough politicians in the House of Commons to stop the rot in this land. But there are now. We've pulled out. There are only about 3% MPs in the House of Commons who publicly name the name of Jesus Christ now. No wonder Satan's having a heyday with our legislation. We pulled out. We took the pessimistic view that the ship's going down. There's no point in trying to do anything about the world. Let's just save as many individuals as we can. I come thirdly to the realistic view. The optimistic view says good is on the increase, evil is on the decrease. All we've got to do is to reunite the world. The pessimistic view says evil is on the increase, good is on the decrease. Therefore we must reject the world. The realistic view says good is on the increase and evil is on the increase and our job is to reclaim the world it sees that both kingdoms are growing it sees the wheat and the tares growing together in the field which is the world it sees the kingdom of God extending from a small grain of mustard seed from a dozen men fishermen and tax collectors to a thousand million people it sees a little bit of leaven in 40 liters of flour until the whole lump of dough is leavened. It sees the growth of the kingdom of God, but alongside it sees the growth of the kingdom of Satan. Now that can only mean an increasing confrontation between good and evil. And what I believe we are going to see over the next few decades is an increasing face-to-face -face confrontation between the two kingdoms, which are both active and growing in our world and the reason why we can't ever have one world there can be no compatibility between these two kingdoms there can never be a union between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light there can never be fellowship between these two there cannot be as long as we have these two kingdoms there can never be one world now as both increase and as both grow together the question comes which one will win and I can't answer that question simply I will have to split the question into two first the question which one will win first and the other question which one will win finally now here is where I want you to listen very hard the Bible tells us quite clearly the answer to these two questions and you must have a firm grasp of this if you're going to make sense of what will happen in our future. Which will win first? The answer is the kingdom of Satan. It will win first. And the Bible predicts one world state 
and one world religion headed up by one world dictator and one world religious leader. It's right there for you to read. And Satan will offer the world peace and security on his terms and those terms are a totalitarian regime that demands total obedience. In biblical terms, the reign of the Antichrist. Many people misunderstand that name. Anti in Greek doesn't mean against, it means instead of. Instead of. Do you realize that the devil once offered Jesus the post of Antichrist and Jesus turned it down? For the devil said to Jesus, you see all these kingdoms, you see the whole world, I can give it to you. And I will, if you'll let me be boss, if you'll bow down and serve me. And it's striking that Jesus did not say they're not yours to give. Jesus said, I'm not accepting them on your terms. Now that is a very striking acknowledgement that this is Satan's world and that he can give the kingdoms of the world to any man who will be his willing tool. And the Bible makes it quite clear that the kingdom of evil will reach the winning post first and that we should be ready for that and expect it. Because under that totalitarian regime under which everybody will have his computerized number and if you haven't that computerized number you will not even be able to buy or sell in the shops. Under that totalitarian regime Jews and Christians will be the ones to suffer for they will not accept it. No man has the right to make the claims that such a dictator will make. Now that's the first answer. Who will get there first? The kingdom of Satan. That was the bad news. Now here's the good news. Who will win finally? The kingdom of Christ. Jesus said those days in which Satan will have his heyday in which having been thrown out of heaven he will vent his anger and frustration on planet earth those days are limited very limited they are shortened for the sake of God's people and at the very height of his apparent power Christ will step back into history and deal him a final death blow he has already fought and won the decisive battle on Calvary. Now was the prince of this world cast out. But he will step back into human history and claim the entire world for himself. The world is not for Antichrist, the world is for Christ. And the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Christ and he will hand them back to the Father. Now that is the picture as I see it for the future. I don't go for the optimism that says good will increase and evil will decrease. I don't believe it. Nor do I go for the pessimism that says evil will increase and good will shrink up towards the end. I go for the biblical position that these two kingdoms will both grow and that the evil will get there first and the good will get there finally. That seems to me the clear picture. Now if that is the clear picture, what then is my attitude to the world today. If I'm an optimist, then I work for the reconciliation of religions and races and everything else. If I'm a pessimist, I pull out of any influence in the world. But if I'm a realist, I say, my task is to establish by God's grace his kingdom. It may not be universally established until the king comes back. But I can enter it now. I can enjoy it now. I can extend it now. For the whole teaching of the kingdom in the teaching of Jesus and throughout the New Testament is that the kingdom is a present process as well as a future crisis. It is not just something we have to sit and wait for till he comes back. It is something we can now enjoy and enter into and seize with force and establish. And Jesus said that harlots and, and tax collectors are seizing the kingdom by force and getting right in there and establishing God's government. Now what does it mean? 
to in enter, enjoy, and extend God's government? Just three things. With this I close, but they're the most important. Number one, it does include saving as many individuals as we can. It does include that. It doesn't stop there, but it must include that. Indeed, it must start there. So to plead with men and women to believe in the Lord Jesus that they are literally transferred from one kingdom to another that they are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the Son of His love. And every single day, 25,000 more people are transferred from one kingdom to the other. That's exciting. And all over the world, the gospel is being preached today. And men and women are transferring kingdoms. And they're coming out from under Satan's power and captives are being set free. And they're coming under the love of Jesus Christ and finding in his service perfect freedom. Establishing the kingdom means first rescuing individuals from the grip of Satan's power. And what a grip he's got of some lives. How he gets some people so tangled up that you wonder if they'll ever get free. And Jesus sets them free. Now last Sunday night you heard a pretty startling testimony of Jack Cridler. Now, if you'd met him 30 years ago, you'd have said, that man is beyond redemption. Satan has such a hold on that man. Such a hatred in his heart, such bitterness, such cruelty, such self-centeredness, that you'll never get him over. But God got hold of Jack Cradley, and he transferred him to the kingdom of Jesus. It's a miracle. That's the first thing we do in our world and that is get as many individuals as we can out of one kingdom and into the other that's the first thing but if we stop there then we're in that pessimistic view we're in the lifeboat situation the titanic outlook the second thing that is involved in entering and enjoying the kingdom is to establish the church as the alternative society as the new humanity as the community of the kingdom which is color blind which is class blind which is a living demonstration of one world in itself in which there are different temperaments different colors different backgrounds different outlooks in which different people are one in Christ now that's the second thing we can do and demonstrate to a world that the people who would normally never have anything to do with each other are one in Christ. They will see then the kingdom. It's not just saving individuals and getting life jackets on them. It is getting them into a lifeboat as well. And into a family. And saying there is an alternative society. There is a family to which anyone can belong. There is a community in which people can relate to otherwise would never get on with each other. Now God is calling us to establish the kingdom in that sense in this world. And I praise God there are a thousand million people all over that globe who are one in Jesus Christ. They still need to learn to get deeper in their unity. They still need to learn to demonstrate it more fully. But they are one. There is one faith, one Lord. There is one body. But there's a third thing that we can do too to establish the kingdom. And here I come to the point of the sermon where I was most conscious that Satan was going to hate me for this. And that is to take the war into the enemy camp and reclaim the world wherever we can for him now let me spell out what I mean I mean that we register the victory of Christ in enemy territory I mean that Christians go from the defensive to the aggressive I mean that Christians are prepared to start saying that part of our society we will reclaim in the name of King Jesus and we will not abandon it to Satan. Now I praise God that he's waking up the church in this country to this third aspect of the kingdom. Not just saving individuals, not just creating a community which presents the alternative society, 
but saying, get right out there and register the victory of Jesus in territory which the devil now possesses. And it is this third area in which we have not been very active over the last few decades, but in which in the 80s God is going to call us to go right in. And it's going to be a battle. It will involve two things. It will involve redeeming everything that can be redeemed. That means getting every part of our culture that can be brought into Christ and getting it right in there. Now that's a concept that's relatively new. One of the men who's helped us to realize that concept more than any other perhaps is now I hear very seriously ill. And that's Dr. Francis Schaeffer. But he has helped many of us to see that the world of the arts needs to be reclaimed for Jesus. Last night you missed a great evening in this building if you weren't here. We had 50 young people down from Edinburgh. They sang, they danced, they had fun, they made us laugh, they helped us to praise, they dressed up in silly kilts, and we just had a great evening. And I saw what was happening that evening. We weren't just enjoying an evening of fellowship and praise. We weren't just giving God an enjoyable evening and blessing his heart. We were pressing Satan out of territory which he's held on to for too long. Satan has had the music for too long. He's had the arts for too long. He's had politics for too long. He's had our culture for too long. And Christians are saying, now in the name of King Jesus, we're going to get that back again. We're going to get dance back for the Lord. We're going to bring music back to the Lord. We're going to establish the kingdom in the world and reclaim territory. We're going to evict Satan from his occupied territory in the name of our King Jesus. And that's meaning Christians on the march. That's meaning we shall not be liked very much because the world doesn't want its culture redeemed. But it's a whole new ball game to realize that God is saying to us, my kingdom must include everything that can be redeemed and that's the truth of the text at the very end of the Bible that when the new Jerusalem comes then the treasures of the nations will be brought into it. Why if there will be music and dancing in heaven let's have it on earth and redeem it for Jesus. If God is an artist then let's reclaim art for Jesus. Why have we been such Philistines when it comes to culture? Because we didn't realize it could be reclaimed in the name of our Lord Jesus. But it will include not just redeeming everything that can be redeemed, it will include eradicating everything that cannot be redeemed. One of the sentences a tutor at Cambridge kept saying to us, which I've never forgotten, I've forgotten most of what he said, but one sentence he kept saying, and it was this, gentlemen, there is nothing secular except sin and that's what I'm talking about right now there is nothing secular except sin a dear old couple in the early days of the cinema went to see a film and as soon as they got in the husband because they were sitting in rows and it reminded him of chapel bowed his head and prayed and his wife dug him in the ribs and said you can't do that here and he just got up and said, well, if I can't do it here, I'm not stopping. There is nothing secular except sin. If there is something that can't be redeemed, then it must be eradicated in the name of King Jesus. If it can't be brought into the kingdom, then it's got to be kicked out of the world. That's establishing the kingdom of God. And it's saying, what, Lord, in our world, what in our culture can we redeem and bring into the kingdom and bring under your reign and under your sovereignty and offer to you. That's why Robert didn't need to apologize for playing that music in the middle of a service. He was offering the music to God. It doesn't have to be music of a chorus so that you can think of the words. It's just music. And God's a musical God and he loves music. There's a little bit of music being reclaimed and offered to God as a, a beautiful act. That's why he played tonight. You see, you can't avoid culture. You can't live in this world without it. 
the very wallpaper you choose. If you can't offer that wallpaper to God, then, then strip it off your walls. But you can offer it to God. Say, God, I've chosen that to make this little room beautiful for you and for people who come into it. That's what I'm meaning by establishing the kingdom. When you housewives are baking your pastry, then redeem that and bring it under the kingdom of God and think, God, I'm going to make some jam tarts for you. You know, isn't it strange and sad that we laugh at the thought of making jam tarts for the kingdom of God? That's the tragedy of where we got to in our thinking. There is nothing secular except sin. And to establish the kingdom, God is saying to his people, go out and establish my kingdom by saving individuals from the kingdom of Satan, by building them into a family in which there are no differences, in which there is unity, in which there is one world, one humanity, one family. But then as a family, go out and redeem everything you can redeem for my kingdom. Reclaim it for me. Evict Satan from his territory. Deny him his hold on that area of life. And bring that back to me. And if it's not something you can bring back to me, then eradicate it by the power of the Spirit. That's the kingdom. It is a supernatural struggle, not wrestling with flesh and blood as you will quickly find, but with principalities and powers who observe no Queensbury rules whatever. But we're going to discover in this land that as we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we're going to discover this, that we can come back rejoicing and saying, even the demons are subject to us. And Jesus will then say, don't let that go to your head. Just rejoice in this, that your names were written in my book. You rejoice that you're a citizen of my kingdom. You rejoice that I chose you before the foundation of the world. You just rejoice that I love you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I've tried as faithfully as I know how to share the burden you laid on my heart this week. If I've said anything out of place, then I'll leave you to correct it. But Lord, I praise you that your kingdom is growing. And that you're calling us in these days to establish it in this land. Lord, thank you that you dealt Satan a death blow at Calvary. That having spoiled principalities and powers, you made a, tr a show of them openly, triumphing over them in the cross. And now, Lord, you're calling us to spoil the goods of the strong man who's been bound, to plunder Satan of his territory. What a calling. Lord, who is sufficient for these things? Lord, burn this message into our hearts. May we rejoice that you're coming again, that your kingdom will triumph finally. Satan may have his day, but you will have the last day. And that day will last forever. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Come and reign. And cause us even now to behave as citizens of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen.